welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We do hope you got some rain this week as we all needed it. For the next hour, we'll be answering your gardening questions. If you'd like to get something answered, please give us a call at 1-800-676-5446. If you'd like to send us an email with some pictures for a future show, that address is byf at unl.edu. We do need to know where you live. Give us as much information as you can so we can answer your question very well. Be sure to check out past shows and features on our YouTube channel. You can also follow us during the week on that Facebook page. So, Kyle, your first show of the season, and you have yeah. both dead things or both live things? Both, both yeah, dead, dead things both now, dead. yep. I have um, some different cutworms here um, and a few different stages. So. Um, you know, really one of those those early early season pests. Um, so as you're thinking about getting your garden go some, going, something to watch out for. So um, they get their name from the fact that you know they have the habit in the larval stage of uh, cutting cutting the plants down. They'll eat around the base of the stem, and uh, that results in in kind of cutting it off right at uh, about ground level. So we do have a number of different species of, of cutworms here in Nebraska that uh, will be present in gardens in the spring. Um, but two of the more common ones that we have are going to be the black cutworm, which uh, I have an adult here, and then the, the larva of a black cutworm, and then also the dingy cutworm. So these uh, do have some different phenology. In the case of dingy cutworm, those are uh, going to be caterpillars that will overwinter here in Nebraska, so they'll emerge you know, very early in the spring um, and can start feeding on, on plants. But the black cutworm, those will uh, actually overwinter in the south. The adults fly up in the spring, lay their eggs. They like to lay their eggs often on um, uh, different sort of weedy hosts, uh, low vegetation, low line vegetation, and then you know as you're getting that garden going, those can move from those weedy hosts into your your different vegetable crops. So they're not too big of a problem um, on younger, or excuse me, um, when they're in the, their younger larval stages. Um, once they reach about half of an inch, that's when they really start cutting plants down. So something to watch out for with those seedlings this spring. Um, likewise, you know any transplanted plants. Uh, if you are seeing any uh, clipping of those plants. Um, usually you can control them by just sort of excluding them. You can put um, some barriers like a can around those plants. Um, that's, that's usually sufficient to keep them from getting away. Stick it down in the soil a few inches, have a, a few inches sticking up. Um, and then, you know, they will crawl away from the plant at night. So you'll want to kind of monitor for them in the evening um, and, you know, dig around in the soil if you're finding any clipped plants. So uh, watch out for these this spring. All right. Thanks, Kyle. Gosh, Rock, you don't happen to have a dandelion, do you? I, as a matter of fact, I do. <laughs> and you're probably wondering why I would show a dandelion, because it's <laughs> such a common, uh, and especially this year, we've seen more dandelions than, than I think we've ever seen in the 30 some odd years I've been here. But the thing about dandelion is that there are optimal timings if you're gonna go the herbicide route. The other thing is, is that right now, the soil is nice and moist throughout most of Nebraska. So they're relatively easy to pull, right? So you've got these long leg thing, but in terms of using a herbicide, if that's the route you choose to go, the best time to control is in the fall, but we also know the best time, the second best time to control them with a herbicide application is after they've flowered. Um, and it doesn't do anything for seed production, but what it does do, that plant is at a disadvantage because it's weak from having to put all that energy into seed production and flower production, and and therefore will, the herbicide does a better job of knocking it back. So if you're gonna go the herbicide route, certainly now would be a time to tr treat, and, uh, and, and you'd probably get a fairly good control, but not great, and then probably gonna have to treat again in the fall. But also they're relatively easy to pull. So if you only got a few in your yard, don't reach for that uh, spray bottle, simply um, knock them down with uh, by pulling them up. Or a soil knife. Or you know, they use a knife or any one of those digging tools that work really well for them. Perfect. Thank That's you, what I would Rock. do. Kyle, you don't usually bring in anything that looks beautiful from a distance, but I'm guessing it's not. You know, if you zoom in a little bit, you can see you can see a lot, a lot of fun fuzzies that are that are growing on some of the some of these blooms. Um, and so here I actually have some scented geraniums, and that have uh, botrytis. And so that, botrytis is a fungal pathogen but very common in a lot of, a lot of greenhouse samples. Um, and very common, in, so Botrytis is uh, favored by moist and humid conditions like we have in a lot, of, a lot of greenhouses. And so if you are out 
um, selecting plants and you notice a few geraniums that have some, some water soaking on the leaves or, they, or you're, you're able to see that there is some, um, some fuzziness kind of growing off of them, really nothing to worry about. What you can do is you can just remove that with your hand and then try to dry the, um, try to dry the plants out, dry the soil out a little bit and really the plants will, will come back just fine. Um, but yeah, it's something that we're seeing a lot of this time of year as we're out um, selecting plants, but nothing to really worry about. All right, thank you, Kyle. John, is this a new variety of asparagus or what is it? Well, you know, uh, Kyle's the one that usually brings the ugly and weird things and I bring the pretty things and we swap places today. Uh, this is the asparagus from your nightmares, right? Uh, this was actually growing in my garden and you see like all of this weird, wacky growth. And this is a, a phenomenon called fasciation. And so you can see here that this is actually two stalks that grew together, but they still grew weird and twisted. Uh, and we get fasciation uh, from uh, a few different things. So it could be a viral disease, but I think this is actually from temperature fluctuations. We get a lot of this during like weird temperature fluctuations. If you see something like this in your asparagus, like I had, uh, it is still uh, completely edible. Uh, you can still enjoy this. Um, and um, you know, it, it won't really affect the, the flavor. I would say probably this, this big clubby woody part, probably not uh, choice eating, uh, but all these little tender things up here, you can uh, you know, just have a little munch snack and, and munch away. So <laughs> a whole meal anyone else need a sock. snack? <laughs> oh yeah, it's beautiful, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Kyle, you get the first round of questions. Um, this one is from Milford and there's just a single picture here on this one. This one, uh, she wants to know if this pick is an ac uh, ash beetle of some sort. It, no, it's not an ash beetle. This is a, a beautiful longhorn beetle. Um, this is actually a hickory borer. Um, so they, they bore into um, generally dying hickory, um, sometimes some other hardwoods as well, but uh, they can be distinguished from some similar looking borers by the alternating uh, white and yellow bands. So is it something that needs to be controlled nope, or just enjoyed? Nope. Yep, it, they're just, you know, in my opinion, a very beautiful beetle, but they're, they're harmless. They only will attack uh, those, those trees that are already sort of dying or dead. All right, thank you, Kyle. Your, your second picture here is from Norfolk. Uh, and um, he says these flies take over sunny windows in their home. They live near Lynch, found predominantly in the fall, much less in the spring and summer, three-eighths of an inch long. Um, built like a house fly, but they have bars on the wings. What are they and how to keep them out? Yeah, um, good question. It's, this is a, a picture wing fly. Um, I'm not aware of a common name for this particular species, but they develop in uh, seed heads of, of Asteraceae. Um, and they are one of the, those really common uh, fall invaders. They, they like to come in to overwinter in homes. And so it's kind of a, a common uh, one that we see along with cluster flies in the winter. So, you know, there's not a, a simple answer. Um, really control, keeping them out is all about exclusion, um, which can be really tough because they can get in the smallest of cracks. So you, you know, I would say really focus on that side of the home where there's an issue, that's, that sunny side, that's pretty common. Um, try to find any cracks or crevices around doors, windows, you know, in the siding, et cetera, seal, seal that up. Um, any place that you have utility pipes or whatever entering the home, um, those can be entry points. Uh, fix any, uh, repair any damaged screens on windows, uh, things of that, that nature will kind of help keep them from coming in and that's, a, that's about all you can do. All right, thanks Kyle. All right, uh, Rock, your first one is from North Platte here and, and uh, she was told this is fescue in the lawn, was also told to use a product that is expensive or Roundup and is fescue bad? Does it overtake and how does she get rid of it if she doesn't want it in the lawn? First off, I'm gonna say I don't think this is fescue. Um, when you see those patches this time of year before the bluegrass greens up and we did have a protracted uh, winter and spring so it took longer for the bluegrass to green up but nonetheless the fescue greens up on or about the same time maybe a few days different but clearly this is ag aggressively growing in and amongst the bluegrass which hasn't greened up now so I'm going to say it's one of the winter annuals so it's probably good they didn't buy the more expensive product for uh, to wipe out fescue so it's either um, little barley uh, downy brome or annual bluegrass and we, we need a better 
better picture, a little more of a close-up if they want to definitively identify it. But I'm pretty confident that it's one of the winter annuals. In that case, you're going to put down a pre-emergent like you would in the spring, only you would put it down in the fall, probably around the first week in September, and then it won't come back from seed. When it gets really hot and the bluegrass starts aggressively growing, it's going to pretty much check out anyway. So there's really not much you can do at this point in time. All right, so send another pic if they want more information. They want more better end identification, All right. they can certainly take another picture. Your next two are um, something that apparently happened last year and then it has continued. This is along the sidewalk, this is in Lincoln. The lawn care company was stumped, thought it was a gas leak, no leaks. They, they took a soil sample, tested negative, no army worms. And so this is actually April of 22 threw down some seed and there is some grass growing there now, but they want to know what, why in the world we might think this died. So I'm going to say that the, uh, the, it wasn't the gas, it wasn't, and the soil sample tested negative. I don't know what that means. I don't know what they were testing for, right? But all that aside, this looks to me, and I'm going to flip it over to Kyle, Kyle to my right, not Kyle to my left, <laughs> after I get done re-hammering here. Um, but basically, I think this is armyworm damage, especially if you look at that, if you, if you can remember that first picture, uh, nature is never linear, right? And if you look at that picture, it ends right at the property line, right? And when, it, when that happens, usually that means that the neighbor treated with something that had a celeprin or you know, one of their grub control products, and then you don't see the damage beyond the property line. Hmm. And also when you see it, we tend to see damage move uphill from sidewalks and stuff because it started in the parkway. Then you know, they march, literally march across like army, across <laughs> the sidewalk, and then they move up. So I'm gonna toss it to Kyle and see if he agrees with my assessment, and, and then, I'll, then I'll be confirmed that maybe I was once, yeah. once right. I, I think that's <laughs> consistent. That looks like that could be consistent with fall armyworms. And, and we saw, you know, a lot of that last last fall. So I wouldn't be surprised at all. If that's what that was. All right. Other Kyle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have two pictures here. Uh, this viewer uh, says her junipers are turning brown and dying. She sent us a kind of a far away and a closer up. Uh, two different banks, and she says it seems to be starting at the tips and then working in. Five to seven years old, she's never had anything like this. Yeah, this is very common on junipers across across the state, um, really across the entire region. Um, not seen a lot on, on uh, cedar trees as well. You know, eastern red cedars, we think that nothing can kill them. Well, the drought and the winter that we have had can. And, and I think that that's really what we're dealing with here is, is some winter injury. Um, you know, when we get tip die back from the, again, from, from, the, um, from the edge of the plant in, typically we wanna start thinking about something more environmental, not necessarily fungal. There, it is possible that there could be some cankers in there. Um, Phomopsis canker is increasing in incidence um, across, across the region as well, but based off of what I've been seeing a lot this week um, and last week as well, I really think it's just winter injury. And unfortunately, those dead branches won't come back. Um, so you may have some holy, holy juniper shrubs. Thanks. You have two pictures uh, now. And this is Oto County on a 40 acre property after the rain. These appeared all over the cedars. They're familiar with the big ones, but the second picture is all sorts of little ones. Is this the same thing? Thing. It is a related thing, and so the the big ones, um, the the big galls with the orange orange horns that are oozing out, that's our old friend cedar apple rust. Um, again, with especially with the rains that we've had this past week, expect these galls to be to be to remain active. The smaller ones are another one of our gymnosporangium rusts, but I think that this that that, 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 that this is actually cedar hawthorn rust. Mm is the, the other one. And so instead of, um, instead of those spores, uh, so instead of those spores blowing onto your apples, your pears, primarily they're going to affect um, your hawthorn and, and any neighboring hawthorns that are in the area. As far as control, really typically we don't need to do a whole lot of control on the, ju um, on the junipers themselves. But if you are worried about controlling uh, or if you are worried about any of diseases on, on any hawthorns or pears, crab apples, apples in the area, now is the time to, uh, now is the time to apply a fungicide or, or a copper-based product would work as well. For those of you who like mushroom hunting, um, 
one one time to, to, to one time to start thinking about looking for morels is when those cedar apple grust galls are going to. So you know, start the hunt. Start the hunt. All right, John. Your first two pictures here are north of Pawnee Lake. These trees are six years old. Took a beating. They they water, but these uh, these arborvita. Do, do, does she need to replace? It's a pretty simple question. Yeah, so this is probably also a form of winter damage. Mm -hmm. The sides of those trees have dried out and we, we have seen so much of that this year because the winter has been so dry. And uh, since it's all on the same side, you know, that's the, the side that the wind is hitting and the wind, the winter wind is so dry. Mm -hmm. So I would say uh, if you looked at cutting out all that damage and you still loved the tree that you saw, you might be able to save it, but probably not because once it's crispy, it's done. So right. you can't really save it. All right, and you have three pictures uh, for this next person. This is Gretna. These arborvitae were planted by the original owners, 2008, and they're dying all on the same side. Same thing, same, exactly. Same yep. story. So, and this one is so so interesting because it's like <laughs> such like that the dead side is the side that gets the wind. I can 99.9% .9 guarantee it that that is what happened. And so, you know, those are probably need to be replaced as well because you're going to be cutting out half of that that tree to, and it's not gonna look pretty, so. All right, thanks, John. Well, bagworms are a menacing problem, problem, especially during the winter or the warmer months of the year. Why are we telling you about them now? Jody says now is a great time to start scouting your shrubs, those other landscape plants for the bags. Here's Jody to tell us more. In Winnie, Nebraska, you are likely familiar with bagworms. Bagworms are caterpillars that are especially damaging to evergreens like spruce, juniper, and arborvitae. They are defoliators that damage our plants right before our eyes because they are hidden in silken camouflaged bags. Bagworm caterpillars are protected in these tough bags which grow with the caterpillar and are covered with the plant material that the caterpillars are feeding on. They can feed on any plant like flowering fruit trees, herbs, grasses, but are especially damaging to conifers because they do not regenerate their needles. Around early June, hundreds of tiny caterpillars emerge from the bags that have overwintered in the landscape. Caterpillars feed from June through August. By the end of the season, their bags can be up to two inches long and attached firmly to a branch or another item near the tree. They are often mistaken for cones or parts of the tree. In early fall, male bagworms emerge as brown furry moths and mate with female bagworms inside the female bag. She leaves hundreds, if not a thousand eggs to stay overwintered on the tree. This means there's only a small period of time when bagworms are actually feeding and an even smaller window of time where they are not protected by the bag. Insecticide application should therefore be targeted for the youngest caterpillars. Biorational products such as Bacillus thuringiensis, Spinosad, or Azadiractin are effective but must be completely in a thorough application on the foliage because they must feed it in order to get enough of the toxicant in order to control them. Once bags are over one inch long, options for management include hiring a professional company or using homeowner products such as acephate, carbaryl, malathion, or synthetic pyrethroids such as bifenthrin or permethrin. Remember to always read and follow the label. Now is the time to look around your landscape and remove and destroy any bagworms that you do see. Come June, again, closely inspect your plants and look for those teeny tiny caterpillars. If you have some young conifers that you want to protect, consider your treatment options and remember, timing is key. Bagworms can really be a serious problem, especially on those junipers that might be dead anyway. <laughs> so take some time this weekend. Do get a bucket of soapy water. Dispose of any of those bags you might find. Throw them on the ground for the birds. That works too. All right, Kyle. 
This is a Lincoln viewer, uh, one picture here. They say this oak was planted three years ago by a nursery. It's been well cared for, but last year it developed these fringed things. What are they? Are they harmful and what can they do about them? Yeah, they, they look like they're um, a gall from probably a cynipid uh, gall wasp. Um, I've seen a number of similar ones on oak before. Um, unfortunately, there's really almost no information about these sort of similar oak rosette goals. <clears throat> so, um, you know, there's not really a whole lot you can do, but the good news is, you know, it's cosmetic. It shouldn't really harm the tree at all. So if it's, if it's pretty isolated, you could prune off that, uh, the branch where you find it and destroy it, but um, otherwise it shouldn't harm the, the overall health of the tree. All right, thanks, Kyle. Your, your second picture here is from Central Omaha. Uh, when they moved a cactus onto the deck a couple days ago, they found a mud glob and then they, it didn't leave a mark on the cactus. What kind of bug left this gift? And she wonders if it has hatched. Yeah, it, it looks like it's um, the nest from a potter wasp. And so they're really, really cool. The, the adults, they, the females, they, they'll collect water and, and dirt separately and then mix it up in their mouth to, to form these, uh, these mud nests. And then they, they will uh, sting a caterpillar and usually a caterpillar and, and paralyze it and that they provision the nest with that and then the larva feeds on that. So um, at least in some cases, there are um, some species where they do overwinter in, in those nests um, as, as pre-pupa. So there is a chance that it was still in there. Um, I'm not sure that it will, will survive now, but, um, but yeah, it was probably still in there if it was from last year. Cool, that's fun. All right, Rock, your first one comes to us from a loyal viewer who is at Lake of the Ozarks. And he wants to know what this weed is. Tiny broad leaves at the base of the stem. Yeah, this is hoary bittercress. Hairy, excuse me, not hoary. <laughs> hairy bittercress, which is a really unique plant because at the top of that plant, you see these pods. And when they desiccate, they literally project. Their highly um, projectile seed comes off of those and it gets all over the place. And so it, they do a great job reseeding themselves. So bittercress is a winter annual. It's gonna show some, showed some white flowers probably earlier this season. It's one of the earliest winter annuals to come about, right? So um, it's an interesting weed and, and tenacious in its way to distribute seed. They do describe it as um, literally explosive dispersal of seed. Very cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Winter oh, annual. did they want to cut, know how to control it? Yeah. Can't do anything right now. It's a winter annual. Yeah. Uh, they could probably use a pre in the in the fall, like we like we would for a spring weed, but you do it in the fall, probably around September. All right, thanks, Rock. Uh, your next two pictures are from Wahoo, and I think the following one is kind of the same grass. But they want to know what type of grass this is, and how do they get rid of it in a predominantly bluegrass lawn? And the other one is from Elkhorn. Okay, this is downy brome, um, mm -hmm. um, which is a winter annual once again, and it's a grassy weed, but there are plenty of herbicides you can use to do it, or it's relatively easy to control just by thickening your lawn a little bit if it's in the lawn bed or whatever. But yeah, that's, this is um, basically uh, uh, downy brome. All right. I did see some that had already put its seed heads on. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I've looked at some that had their seed heads out, but the seed's not mature yet. So I, I still think keeping them mowed so the seeds don't get produced and whatever. So keep them mowed down, but you can't really do much this time of year anyway. All right, thanks, Rock. Mm -hmm. uh, Kyle, this is um, two pictures here. This is a maple tree about 35 feet tall, has a cracked area about seven inches from ground level. And I think he sent a picture of the, the, the crack, yeah. Yeah. Mushrooms grew inside last fall. It is damp inside at times with loose material outside. It is close to the garage in the house. Um, Advice, please. <laughs> I would contact a certified arborist very quickly and um, try to get that tree removed. And so the I was, wasn't was really able to figure out what, what mushrooms were were growing inside of that crack. It, they almost looked like an almost looked like armillaria, but um, again, couldn't couldn't quite tell. But with with it being that that large, that close to the house, um, that tree is that tree is dead. It's just having trouble acknowledging it yet, um, and so <laughs> it it does need to it does need to be removed. All right. You have three pictures uh, from North Platte on this next one, and then a fourth picture that is probably similar. Uh, it's a fruit-bearing cherry tree. She wants to know what is going on with the bark and sap bubbles. 
Yeah, yeah and there's a crack, yeah. obviously. And then our third picture, I think, is the bubbles. And yeah. then the fourth one is actually from Sarpy County, and it's bubbles. Yeah, so there's a few a few different things that are going on there. Um, the the first is that I'll talk about is the crack that's on the base of the base of the, um, of this tree, and I think that that is most likely some more winter injury, um, probably frost or something like that. You know, with uh, fruit trees have fairly thin bark, and so we do we do tend to see that. Um, if that's all that was the, if that was the only problem, I wouldn't be wouldn't be too worried about it, um, as that bark will probably recover then this year. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, typically the, the cracking isn't as big of an issue unless you see like other things going on with that cracking. Awesome. Thank you. I, I should, have, should have warned you about that. That's okay. <laughs> I, you woke me up. It's okay. okay. <laughs> um, and then the, the other thing, though, is the, the, the ooze or that bacterial exudate that, that is coming out. And so can't really tell what, what it is here. Um, it could be, could be fire blight. And so if you are seeing some blackened petioles, blackened leaves with the shepherd's crook, most likely it, um, we would, would be dealing with fire blight. Um, otherwise, there is a bacterial canker that's caused by a Pseudomonas bacteria that causes very similar symptoms. Now this picture, I, um, the last picture, I think is actually something else. And so I think that is just gamosis. Um, mm -hmm. And gamosis, we see it on a lot of fruit trees. Generally, it's a sign of some other stress. Um, and so whether it is environmental stress, which, which, we've ha we've, which we've had a lot of this year, could be mechanical stress, could be insect feeding, or it could be a sign of some other um, fungal or bacterial disease. Um, when I looked at that last picture a little bit closer, it did look like the, uh, the bark was a little bit sunken right around there, indicating that maybe there's some sort of canker, um, possibly, uh, possibly a Cytospora canker. But the gamosis that's coming out is actually just the sap from the tree that is showing its signs of stress. All right, thanks, Kyle. All right, John, uh, quick answers on these. The first is, I love your show. How about this first tree? There are two pictures. The first is that. I think the second is the base of this tree. Is this tree a goner? It's dead. <laughs> <laughs> that Not is even a very thinking succinct about it. answer for you. It's <laughs> dead. <laughs> All right, your next two pictures are Southeast Lincoln. This is, uh, let's see, this neighbor showed damage to the tree in the yard, didn't know what it was. Could he, what could he do about it? Again, there are two pictures here. What do you think? Yeah, that's another one like, so the crack is one thing, but seeing what's going on underneath, it looks like there's some dead wood underneath. Uh, it looks like there's a crack that goes into the tree. So I definitely think that's a candidate for removal as well. As Kyle said, it's dead. It just hasn't acknowledged it yet. I so, love that. Yeah. All right, thanks. Well, we finally got some good moisture here in Lincoln, and that means our garden will soon be planted. Let's take a few minutes to hear from Terry James about what's going on in the backyard farmer garden. This week in the backyard farmer garden, we are enjoying the much appreciated rain that the, almost the whole state has been seeing over the past few days. Although it has stalled us in getting our wall completed and some of our plants out in the garden. We are really happy that we are getting this moisture that's really needed all across the state um, with many of us being in drought areas. We're enjoying some of our small fruits that are just getting the, uh, the flowers on them. And we are watching our spring gardens that have planted our peas and radishes and lettuces that are coming up in the raised beds. So enjoy the rain as we get it and stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. Right now it is time for the lightning round. John, you are first up today. I'm ready, I can All take right. them. <laughs> <laughs> you think. Okay, this is a Lincoln viewer who got one of those little pixie lilies that was in full bloom as a gift. She's wondering, can she plant it now? And if so, where, what conditions do they like? Uh, I would wait just a little bit, let it warm up a little bit more, and uh, full sun. All right. Uh, we have a viewer who wants to know whether two varieties of bluebird, bluebirds, blueberries, are needed for best fruiting. Uh, that is true, though Nebraska is not the best place to grow blueberries. <laughs> All right. Um, we have a viewer who wants to know whether they should cut off the flowers or the little seed head things on daffodils and tulips to conserve the energy in the bulbs. Uh, it's not necessarily needed. It'll help a little bit, but 
do whatever you want. All right. Uh, we have someone who wants to use their eggshells or their coffee grounds directly into planting beds. I would compost them first just to not attract animals. All right. Uh, if, if this Sioux City viewer plants different varieties of tomatoes right next to each other, will they cross-pollinate? Not necessarily because the, the flowers are closed. They don't cross-pollinate easily. All right, so there you go. That was very nice. Not time for that last question, so I'll save it for you. Okay, first Kyle. Ready. Ready? <laughs> this is a viewer who, who has uh, mushrooms in their lawn that have come up recently, and they're concerned about pets and whether they are poisonous or what exactly should they do about mushrooms in their lawn. So it depends what type of mushroom it is. Some are poisonous, some are not. Um, without knowing more about it, we can't really make a, make a determination. Um, regarding what to do about it, not a whole lot, um, aside from, aside from uh, uh, mechanical removal. All right, um, this is a viewer who has pepper plants growing in their greenhouse or in their house. All of a sudden they've seen small little spots like blisters on the back of the leaves and then the leaves die, any idea? Most likely it's an edema, um, so it's caused by uh, watering, um, water, moisture um, sitting on the leaves too long. All right, this is a DeWitt viewer that wonders whether oak anthracnose will appear on the little bitty leaves or will that happen later? Uh, it certainly can, yes. Okay. Uh, we have a viewer who found a white substance on the leaves of their squash last year. They wonder what it was and what will happen this year. Powdery mildew, it'll probably come back this year. <laughs> oh, that's not very encouraging. <laughs> I had to be quick. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, Rock, this is a follow-up email to uh, one of your questions from two weeks ago. And you mentioned a chemical that starts with an F that you use to kill ground ivy. What was that? Um, Fluoxapyr. 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 Tell us more. How does that work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, John. <laughs> we have a Western Nebraska viewer who wants to know how to control puncture vine, puncture weed, sorry, in Western Nebraska. I'm assuming they're meaning punk puncture vine, mm -hmm. uh, which is a broadleaf, or they all could also be talking about grassy sunbur. But let's assume puncture vine. It's best controlled with pre-emergence, just like you would with a crabgrass preventer. Not all of them work. Um, we have some information on our turf.unl.edu website for that. Okay, uh, several people are asking questions about whether it is time, the timing for weed and feed. Is it past time, current time with the cool temperatures? Um, they, they can certainly do that now. We're not big fans of weed and feed products because they put herbicide where you don't need it. Um, we would rather use spot spray for broadleaf weeds if you feel the need to use a herbicide. All right. Um, another viewer wants to know, is it time for the second application of a pre-merge if they put down one already? If they put one down already, then they should, probably should need to wait because we're just now in the optimal timing for the first round. All right, we have a viewer who wants to know how to kill all the broadleafs in their lawn without killing all the clover because they want a clover lawn. We all would like to be able to do that. <laughs> in other words, yeah, no. Yeah, there, there is no, I mean, the broadleaf herbicides, there used to be a herbicide that worked, it's off the market for other reasons, um, so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and other I'm calling Kyle. foul because the clock didn't start until your second question. <laughs> Well, I could I'm call watching. foul because you watching. interrupted <laughs> while I was talking. I'm watching. I, I, I could call foul. the gloves come off. <laughs> Back up here. Kyle, you're going to win just for that reason. You're okay. the only one not fighting. Okay. This Kyle wasn't. <laughs> I didn't say which Kyle. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. This Kyle. Are you ready? I'm ready. Is it time for viewers to start looking for the magnolia scale crawlers and then treat them? Um, you know, actually, I'll pass. I'm not sure on that. Okay. Is there a safe way to eliminate ground nesting bees if people are really concerned about them with children and pets? No, there's, I don't think there's really a need to, to remove them because they're, they're solitary. You know, there's really not a concern with them stinging children or pets. All right. This is a viewer who uh, last year had tiny holes in a lot of their perennials starting right now and Last year we said it was flea beetles. Is that possible this early this year because they're seeing them already? Yes, it is possible. Yeah. And what do they do about it? Oh gosh, um, that's a tough one. It, it would depend. 
Okay. Um, we have someone who had, wants to know how to keep juvenile praying mantises alive. Uh, good luck. They, they, <laughs> they tend to eat each other. Um, so you can use, try to feed them fruit flies. You okay. can get those from a pet store. All right. Uh, this viewer had borers in their red twig dogwood terribly. Well, is there a treatment now or, or is it, they'll probably come back? Yes, probably come back. All right. Mosquito services are being advertised. Is that a yes or no for your yard? Uh, I, I really don't know. Okay. No. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Who won? Nobody won. Me. No, nobody won. The I'll, Kyles I'll, both I'll take won. it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> John, you get plants of the week. <laughs> okay. Well, we have a lovely yellow duo here. And up top, you might think, well, this is a carnation or a rose or something like that. And that is actually a narcissus, or sometimes we refer to flowers like this as daffodils are all closely related. And it's a double variety. So you see that very cute little flower. So if you plant daffodils and things like that, you can find those, those little tiny double ones. And those are really fun. And then down below, uh, we have this variegated yellow archangel. And this is very interesting because it's actually in the mint family. Uh, and most mints have sort of purplish blue flowers. This one, as you see, is bright yellow. Uh, and so it's kind of fun. And the, the thing about mints is that they spread. Uh, this one you kind of want to spread because it's an it makes a lovely ground cover, so it will actually uh, spread uh, underground and sort of fill in an area. And so that is an excellent ground cover uh, option that will grow in um, actually pretty not nice soil conditions. It's pretty hardy. Perfect. Thank you, John. All right, Kyle, you have an interesting one. This is a Lincoln viewer and sent um, pictures of something eating the leaves of their Japanese tree lilac. Planted three years ago, obviously those leaves are not, this is a, a picture from last year. Yeah. It says by late summer, looks like this, next spring the trees look fine again. Is this insect ragging? Is this maybe something different? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually gonna ask Kyle about this too. So I'm, this is one has a lot of unknowns for me. I'm not entirely convinced that this is insect feeding, it could be. Um, but also I think, you know, the, the description of the way it kind of declined throughout the summer and leaves curled and looked like it was gonna die. I, I'm not sure that that's related to any sort of foliage feeding here either. So um, really with, with lilac, the biggest you know, sort of insect pest that, that I think of would be lilac borers, which is a, a clear wing moth. Um, they don't, you know, they don't, the adults don't feed on leaves or anything. Um, they can cause some pretty significant uh, injury boring into, into branches. Um, they can you know, cause some expanding at, at the base of those branches, uh, the bark to, to kind of come loose around there. Um, they can make it susceptible to breaking. But um, so, you know, without knowing more about what the, what the branch uh, bark looks like, it's hard to say if there's any issues with that. But the way it, it was sort of declining throughout the, uh, the summer and then the leaves were curling, I was kind of wondering if it could be an abiotic or, or even a pathogen issue. So I don't know, Kyle, if you have any thoughts on that? You know, um, some, there are some trees that will, will get leaf tatters that appear. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not familiar with it on lilac, but I don't really necessarily know why it wouldn't occur on lilac. And that does tend to be something abiotic. Basically, the, the leaves aren't developing the way that they are supposed to, and they come out looking all, all sort of tattered. Yeah. Nothing you can do. Nothing All right, do, we'll no. wait till later in the season. Your second two pictures are a viewer in Omaha, Kyle. Found these ants along the sidewalk. What are they doing? Will they go into the grass and then work their way into the house? Yeah, these are probably pavement ants. Um, we tend to see them nesting, um, you know, around pavement, um, under slabs of houses, etc. Um, they they are outdoor ants. They 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 have their nest. They're colony outside, but they will they will come inside, especially in the spring. You know when they're ramping up that colony and they're looking for food, um, and they find all kinds of easy access to food in your kitchen. So um, they will forage inside um, to control. If, if you're finding them inside the home, um, one you know seal up any cracks um, around the foundation, any place that you can find that that can help uh, exclude them from coming in. Uh, you can use baits inside, liquid baits. Those are effective inside. Um, outside, if you wanted to try to treat them, um, there are a few different, you know, baiting options. There's granular baits you could put down. Um, I don't know a whole lot about the granular baits for ants. Um, there are some liquid baits that you can also use outdoors. 
Um, so those, those would be a few options, but you just want to make sure you're following any label instructions with those. All right. Thanks, Kyle. All right, Rock, you have three pictures here. This is rural Trumbull, Nebraska. A tall, thin, thin blade, fine blade fescue is encroaching in the buffalo grass. And he's wondering how best to eliminate that without harming the buffalo grass. Well, the, first of all, this may or may not be the fescue that's in his yard, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's difficult to tell from those pictures. It could be any number of the winter annuals. That's not a fescue seed head we hear here see in this picture, the final one. But I do think it's another grass. So I think there's more than one grass going on here. So I just ask the viewer to maybe send us a close up because the control recommendation is going to vary considerably um, depending upon what the species is. All right, thank you. And then you have uh, just one picture here. This is a viewer who says, what is causing this? He used a winterizer last fall. He's got spots of really good grass and then hardly anything around it. Yeah, first thing I do is ask if they have a, a dog because mm -hmm. um, this looks a lot like dog spot. If they don't have a dog, there could be another species of grass that moved in. They do have some grass greening up around it, but once again, we've been talking, it's been like winter annual night tonight. And so uh, it could be another winter annual grass in there. But I, if they've got a dog, that definitely looks like dog spot. Or if there was a damaged area and they did some overseeding, that area would heat up more, so it'd be green quicker. There's a lot of things that could be going on, but um, if, if I, the first thing I think about is dog spot. All right, uh, Kyle, your first two pictures are an Ashland viewer. Uh, the first is a peach. The second, I think, is a cherry or an apple. Wonders uh, what all these spots are as they're leafing out right now. She sent this on May 3rd. Yeah, so um, I think that this is something environmental, most likely due to um, most likely due to the cooler temperatures that we've had. I've mentioned um, the, in the email they mentioned that it was on some other pests, some other plants as well, but that that darkness is mostly most likely abiotic. All right, so nothing they can do. Nope. All right, uh, John, you have somebody who says. <laughs> Appears to have a blue spruce branch coming out. Oh, this is his asparagus one. So on the, that's not a <laughs> That's blue a very spruce. interesting looking blue spruce <laughs> there, Cameron. Yeah, I've got the wrong one. So this is the asparagus one. And he transplanted this with a tractor. And then he's wondering whether he can harvest any of the shoots. This is Tarnov, Nebraska in Platt County. Uh, I wouldn't harvest any in the year that you transplant. I would uh, do a limited harvest in year two, and then you can do a fully harv full harvest year three. Um, basically, you want to leave any stalk that is the size of a pencil or smaller. All right. And your next one is, this is a yucca, and um, planted in the late 70s when there was lots of sun, and now there isn't. She's cut it down. It keeps coming back. She wants to know whether she should get rid of it. Yeah, so if it's in a shaded area, it's not going to do much. So I would either move it or get rid of it. <laughs> All right. Well, some parts of our state experienced some devastating fires a couple weeks ago. Benjamin Bohall from the Nebraska Forest Service was kind enough to help homeowners, especially in rural areas with a few landscape tips that just might help save your home. I'm sure for anybody who's been watching the news, uh, the biggest thing has been the Road 702 fire, which happened, oh, roughly two weeks ago. Before that, we had the Road 739 fire. Uh, the Road 702 burnt about 45,000 acres. That was in uh, Furness County and Red Willow County. Before that, the 739 fire was in Furness County as well and in Gosper County. So it's been a very active fire season so far. What's funny is typically we'd be having this conversation in June all the way up until September because that's a typical wildfire season. But our crews have been going hard since November. You know, the uh, dry summer last year, the record low snowfall this time around during the winter, and of course the high winds that have been happening have led to numerous red flag warnings around the state and then of course these fires. We have to worry about areas like typically in suburban parts of the town, uh, areas that have like larger lots, for example, you know, where we have more vegetation. That's not so much an issue in our inner cities like downtown Omaha, downtown Lincoln. So for homeowners who live in more rural parts of the state or have larger lots with vegetation on their properties, we want them to kind of take into consideration what they're planting. So in Nebraska, we subscribe to FireWise, which is a model that helps us determine um, basically a good strategy for what we're going to be planting you know, around our homes. 
Uh, we have three different zones that create what we call defensible spaces. We start with uh, what's called the immediate zone. That's within five feet of a structure. Uh, within those five feet, we want to avoid things like planting juniper, you know, something that's highly flammable. We want to keep our grass mode, keep it very short around the base of our homes, you know, sheds, decks, you name it. Uh, we also want to focus on planting things like uh, perennials as opposed to wildflowers. From there, we move into what we call our intermediate zone. That's five to 30 feet away from a structure. The big focus there is pruning. We want to look around and see if we have, you know, trees like limbs hanging over our rooftop. You know, that's essential. We want to prevent the spread of wildfire. If we have an active fire situation, those limbs are coming down. It's obviously a problem. Um, in terms of planting, we'll focus more on, you know, oak, uh, honey locust, elm, still staying away from juniper, spruce, you know, any of the highly flammable sort of plants. From there, we move to what's called the extended zone. That's 30 to 100 feet away from a structure. And that's where we're really gonna focus not so much on what's around the house. We'll be looking at what's in our yards. You know, what kind of litter is there? Do we have down tree limbs? Are there branches, pine cones, seeds? These things are all flammable and they can cause a problem. We're not thinking so much about, you know, what's gonna start a fire. We wanna stop the spread of the fire in that area. And uh, this is also the point where we can start looking at juniper, uh, spruce, uh, kind of color fir, that we can actually plan the, plant to those items. It's been said that you can't fool Mother Nature. Hopefully some of these tips Ben offered will keep future fires away from your home. You know, there are many more features you can watch that will help you create a more beautiful landscape, keep that lawn green, or grow your own food on the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. So you can watch this feature and all of those past programs there also. Take a few minutes, check it out after the show, hit subscribe. All right, guys, we're on a roll here, almost lightning round. So first one for you is from Elkhorn. Kyle, is this a good ladybug or one of those Asian ones? And how do you tell the difference? Um, it, is, it is the Asian lady beetle. Um, in short, you tell the, the difference by the sort of the M spot behind the head. Okay. Um, your second one here is a green one viewer, and they're wondering what kind of bugs these are that they found in a spirea. They look like roly polies. <laughs> yeah, this is this is really cool. Um, it looks like maybe like a, a mantis otheca or something, um, mm. and I haven't seen this before. But these are dermestids um, inside of there. So um, like carpet beetles, you know, that we get in home. That's that's what these essentially are. <clears throat> so I think maybe it's like a Trogoderma species. Some of those will feed in nests of bees and wasps, but I've, I've never seen them in, in an Oothica before. Pretty cool. Oh dear, <laughs> poor mantis is gone. <laughs> well, they're probably dead first anyway. <laughs> okay, Rock, uh, dandelion control. This is- Holy uh, cow. <laughs> <laughs> My dandelion population is out of control, and she doesn't like to use pesticides. She probably knows she'll need to. Uh, she wonders about weed and feed, so. Okay, I would say no weed and feed here uh, because they don't want to use pesticides. There's a product called Fiesta, it's been available for a couple of years now. We've tested it for the last three years, and if, you're, if you can put on three to four applications, probably one yet this spring or two or three in the fall, you'll get pretty good somewhere in the neighborhood of 85% control. The product is Fiesta, and it's organic, and um, probably will alleviate some of the fears that the individual has with using a synthetic pesticide. All right, excellent. So your next one here is, uh, what is this and should she eliminate it? It's on the fringe of a berm in West Omaha. Yeah, this is henbit and should, they should try to get it before it continues to seed. It's probably seeding right now, at least it is through Eastern Nebraska. Just simply pull it up, it'll pull up relatively easy. There's no need to use a herbicide now because all it does is produce more seed and die anyway. It's a winter annual, so it's gonna die when it gets hot, but I would still consider pulling it up to try to pull away some of that seed uh, that could get dropped. All right, thank you, Rock. Okay, Kyle, uh, your first one is from Ashland. And uh, again, it's the same viewer who had the, the peach one, but this is a dappled willow that she is also seeing the spots on the underside. So a completely different family and completely different plant. Yeah, again, I think it's due, um, primarily due to some of the cooler temperatures that we've had. Uh, could be anthracnose, but we haven't really had the heat for, um, for dogwood anthracnose yet or willow anthracnose. Willow anthracnose, all right. And I didn't realize willow got anthracnose. It's everything gets anthracnose. <laughs> and willows get everything. And willows get everything. All right, your next, uh, your next one is an Omaha viewer. 
And they want methods of treating snow mold in the lawn. And um, they had it all over last spring. They removed a film on the grass circles and then dropped new seed in it. So what you're seeing for new there was where the mold was last spring. So it's a little complicated here, but. Yeah, so I mean, it's with, um, with fr fr fresh grass seed, it greened up a little bit quicker. Um, that's why we have, we have those spots that are, that are showing up there. Typically in Nebraska, we don't really need to worry about controlling snow mold. Um, it's not as it's not consistent consistent enough of a disease to require any sort of her, uh, any sort of fungicide. Um, what they did was really the, the 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 perfect thing, and so get rid of the dead grass that um, that's there, and then just reseed, and hopefully you'll have good control. All right, and this was not a snow mold year anywhere. It was not a snow mold year, no. All right. Um, John, we have a question here that is a tree planted roughly 15 years ago. Last couple of years, he's seen what looks like a blue spruce branch growing right out of the trunk. And if he removes it, will it fill back in? This is actually a dwarf Al Alberta yeah. spruce. So what does he do here? <laughs> so uh, this is cool. I get to say that too, Kyle. This is cool. Um, <laughs> uh, so this is a dwarf Alberta uh, Alber I can't speak, uh, Alberta spruce. Uh, and so we have a reversion here. So that's sort of like a, a cultivar, like a special breed of a white spruce. And so we have this spruce growing out of that. So you can try to cut it out uh, to sort of save it, but it's not, it's like such a big part of the, the tree already that it's not really, it's gonna create a big hole. Uh, if you leave it, it will just keep growing and it'll be like a giant tree, so. <laughs> exactly. All right, your second one here is, uh, Will this plant survive? This is actually fine line buckthorn. She didn't know the name, so we'll tell her that. This year it appears that the top is dead. There is a little green at the bottom. What can she do other than what can she do? I would say wait and see because we have like slow greening up of things this year. Uh, if, it, if it continues to, to look dead, then cut it out, uh, but just wait and see. All right, things are a little bit slow. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, we have announcements of way cool things that are going on in the gardening world for you. Uh, the first is the Nebraska Herbal Society Annual Plant and Bake Sale, May 7th at New Hope Church, 45th and Orchard here in Lincoln, and we have a, a website uh, or a Gmail address on the screen for you. Second one is the May Museum's 23rd perennial plant sale, May 7th, 9 to 12, rain date May 8th, 1 to 4, and that is in Fremont, Nebraska. And our final one is um, Holy Trinity Arts Festival, May 14th, 10 to 5, the Church of the Holy Trinity. We have also a dot com on that one, and that should be fun. So make sure you do send us those sorts of things if you need to. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. And unfortunately for you, you are <laughs> the first one in line Lucky or me. not. So we actually had a viewer send in a question wondering whether this cold, cold weather is going to affect the pollinators that were already out, the bees and, and so forth. I, no, I don't think it should. That was a lightning round answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. John, I'm going to skip to you because this one came in from the Master Gardeners and you've got like 40 seconds. So this is a Dawson viewer. Okay. Full sun, big boy and better boy. Last year's crop had spots in the tomatoes, but they were whitish green on the outside. What went on? Was that ripening or was that... So when we get that whitish green kind of stuff, that could be actually too much heat. Mm -hmm. uh, we get some weird things on with temperature. So I would uh, watch for that. There's not really you, anything you can do. It, it gets hot in the summer and sunburn, sunburn, like things like that. So yeah, th there's nothing really that you can do for that.